get started with our second session. Uh, this is uh, not as much a uh, uh, science session as more observatory going on and, and uh, policy. So uh, we'll have three speakers, and then we'll have this uh, poster pop up for people who have uh, signed up. We have some submitted online, so we'll have a review of posters after the last talk to stay seated, and we'll hear a little more uh, mm -hmm. a little more science uh, if you want to. Present during this session, feel free to like sneak up the side here and write your name on this piece of paper. Um, to get us started, we have uh, the director of the Tech Observatory since 2014. That's right. 2014, uh, Hilton Lewis. And uh, he has a 30 minute slot, so extra time for the boss. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and I'll help by I'll delete the word science out of it, if that's okay with you. <laughs> oh, oh, just um, me. oh, and John Amira, the chief scientist, will join me. We're going to attack these presentations. Okay, so let me just start with a couple of status uh, points. And first of all, I want to welcome Bruce to the poll, back to the poll after uh, uh, wandering in the desert for a while. Um, so, as you know, Bruce will be the director of UTO, but will also serve on the Caribou. Uh, so, we're really thrilled to, to have Bruce back. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank Claire Max. Uh, she, and she, of course, is the outgoing director, and Connie Rockersey was the interim. Both did uh, wonderful service. Claire, uh, I really want to acknowledge for a very, very long storied career inside Tech 2 um, on many of the governance bodies, but also uh, particularly on adaptive optics. And she was really one of the people who really pushed forward AOA Tech. So we'll miss Claire. And, uh, and uh, but of course, Bruce will step up. And uh, just to let you know this afternoon, John and Bruce will uh, give a talk on uh, at the lunch break on uh, on uh, the uh, Astro 2020. All right, so very quickly on COVID-19, because this is no longer interesting to anyone. Uh, at Keck, basically, we, we have a slightly uh, more stringent protocol and the CDC recommends for the status in Hawaii. And if you visit, uh, masks are not required, they are recommended indoors. Um, and if you're a visitor who's going to stay at the VSQ or going to spend time working at the summit, you need to bring your vaccination certificates as well and, and take a test. But we're reopening the observatory now gradually to, to casual visitors again. Um, so if you have a group that needs to come and visit, let us know and we'll work with you to, to allow them to, to visit. And we're constantly monitoring the situation at camp. Now, in terms of the science statistics, uh, this year is essentially, well, there's been more science as a percentage of, of time on sky, um, but it's because the weather has been unusually good. In fact, our fault statistics, our technical downtime is a little worse by about 20% than it typically has been. A lot of it's related to AO factors that we're trying to bring back under control. Uh, if it had not been for uh, December, in fact, we would have had a banner year uh, because typically our science science photons account for a little under half the time on sky. So it's been a good year from that perspective. Um, I'm also very pleased to tell you that we've renewed the cooperative agreement with NASA. We do this every five years for a five-year period. And uh, so that is now in place. NASA is a one-sixth partner. And through that, of course, the national community gets access. And uh, so that's a, it's a testament to a long and uh, effective relationship, and I'm pleased that continues. And in fact, uh, the cycle two for JWST will include uh, 10 joint nights, so 10 nights of NASA's allocation for joint allocation uh, between JW and, and CAC. And then we are participating in NASA's great observatory uh, precursor science and their uh, TDAM uh, program as well. So I think our connection with NASA is strong and healthy and continues to be something that will be uh, very productive for the observatory. All right, so at this point, I'm going to pull John up to talk about instrumentation, and then I'll come back in a little while to talk about some social aspects. And we're going to do a real brief uh, technical glitch fix. Shelly, can you DJ Shelly in the house to, I guess, stop and restart this? Yeah. It's, it's frozen on Zoom, so it's fine here, but it's not advancing on Zoom, so we're just going to stop and restart. There. That's you. Yeah. That's 
the rest is go. All right. Let me try. Let, we'll we'll try. Okay, so I've got a, uh, some updates on upcoming instrumentation. The first update on instrumentation I'm going to get has nothing to do with instrumentation. Um, it has to do with data at Keck and the ongoing uh, transition to, to a revamped data system at Keck, the Data Services Initiative. Um, a number of the people responsible for that work are in this room and have my, my gratitude and thanks. Um, this is a multi-year initiative that's still mostly in the back-end architecture phase for what you all see to really modernize the end-to-end -end flow data. Um, and eventually it will be inclusive of almost all steps of observation, either from the observation planning through the instrument configuration during the night, through the uh, data pipeline processing, through to the archive. It's not a queue, but it is uh, a way of, of doing a lot of that planning in advance. Ideally, so that the, the pipelines are well informed. There was a shout out to Pipe It this morning. A lot of this stuff isn't plugged into Pipe It. A lot of it will get plugged into new data reduction pipelines and new instruments come online. One piece of advertising that I want to give is that as of uh, last late last month, every single instrument that tech us to silicide is pushing its data in real time, uh, the raw data in real time to the archive. That's testament to the work of the folks at Nexi and at Tech. Um, and Jeff Mader is going to talk in great detail about that um, and other things going on for TSI in session uh, at the close of the day today. So I encourage you all if you want to hear more about this stuff to go to Jeff Paul. All right, uh, the Keck Planet Fund. So the, you know, the how it started, how it's going, Joe, is over here on the left, for those of you who never saw it this way, this is what the basement used to look like. These are the long and short delay lines for the interferometer that were there in the, in the basement. Uh, that is where, down below where Keck One is, and all this is all this instrumentation, all the optics, all the rails, and all that stuff is now gone. So that Andrew's pride and joy, which is sitting here at the end, or at least a major component sitting here in the hall, hall has been completely cleaned out, replumbed for power, glycol, air, electronics, all that stuff for the Keck Planet Finder. And so we're actively in the stages of integration of all the major components of taking up that Keck. Um, the optical bench has been reassembled it's in the vacuum chamber. The chamber is at vacuum. We're getting dangerously close to being able to cool down the detectors. Um, the fiber injection unit testing, uh, this is this slide is actually out of date uh, because it's already ongoing. And I'll show you a little bit of that for a second. So Solar... I'm, gonna, I'm gonna switch uh, sharing. I'm gonna share mine. Okay. Sorry, because you're still frozen. Still frozen. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Zoom. Can I keep talking? Sure. Okay, I'll keep my um, We've got a solar calibrator that's going to be running during the day to monitor the sun and inform uh, KPF's observations. Uh, and so that's going to be running many, many days of the year. And the testing of that is going to begin soon. And the notional first light is in November, perhaps. So the link that I have from Andrew and his team. Um, the most important for the people listening in the room is that shared risk observations will begin in 2023A. Uh, one fun thing is that last week, Wednesday night, we tested the fiber injection unit past light through it. So this may not look like a very exciting thing, but I promise you, this was a very exciting thing for all the people who worked really hard to try to see this. Um, we also had to test the guider system. Whenever you have a new instrument, you have to test the orientation of the guider and all the different ways that it bounces and flips and rotates. So we uh, also passed light from a star, or was this the moon? Yeah, the that's, our that's our tourist through the HEK spectrometer. This is not the first light of the instrument. This is a, a subcomponent validation, but you know, there's starlight starting to hit things. And then we tested the guide orientations with uh, some things we all know and love, right? You've got Saturn here, Jupiter here. I love this picture of Mars. And this is the moon, right? They point me at the moon. <laughs> Andrew likes to tell this joke, and I'm stealing Andrew's joke. Is that you know most people think it's not, this is what astronomers do, and we don't usually do it, and we actually did it. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay, um, moving on to KCRM. You know this is this is really an exciting six months. We're we're going to be integrating, testing, and deploying two flagship instruments within the span of half of a year, and it's a huge testament to all the staff at Tech, all the instrument teams throughout the UC and Caltech system that we're getting to this moment. Um, KCWI was taken offline and in June, and I had to be mildly sedated when this happened. Uh, craned off of the K2 deck, brought down the floor, pushed down the hallway, craned over the K1 NAS deck, 
and into a clean room on the floor of the table and go. Um, this was an extremely well planned and executed mission up to the point that you could put a ton of googly eyes on here so that it looks a little bit like Thomas Tank Engine. Um, but you know, if, if you want to see how to freak John out, this is how you freak John out. Right? And this is just a time series that you know still made into a movie of taking John's current convenience terms and suspending it over the uh, the, the dome floor. But this was this was a wonderful. Set of operations uh, done by the, the staff of tech. Right now, we're integrating um, new components into the back of, of, of KCWI. Um, it's now on the dome clean room, putting in new electronics, uh, the guide camera. Pre ship review of that is next month in October. And pending that review, we'll ship in early November and do it, uh, accept, uh, an integration test throughout the winter. First light is notionally planned for March and commissioning, and then shared risk observing if all goes well. To begin in May ish of 2023A. Watch this space because all of these steps haven't happened yet. And so there could be some movement in that, in that step. Um, to prove whoa, that, uh, oh, it's not there. It is. Okay. This is the new guide, right? To give you a sense of, of how big some of these things are. Uh, there's a new annular guider that's on the back so that we can have. Uh, the whole system guide well. That work is already ongoing. There's a lot of stuff going on in the uh, electronics rack that's been completed. Rosalie is somewhere here in the room. She's leading up that effort on the SAT and the tech. And so Mahalo to Rosalie, Rosalie and all the folks here at Caltech working on the system. Um, and it's just going to be uh, an amazing uh, extension of, of KCWI. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Lots of other things are, are happening at the observatory, except for this pointer. There we go. Um, the infrared laser frequency comb will be delivered and commissioned with NearSpec in spring of 2023. Um, COPL, there was a COPL science meeting that some of y'all were at uh, yesterday, um, but it's completing its laser tomography AO elements. Here are actual four laser dots on the sky. So, you know, we're actually propagating lasers on the sky. Um, the SCALES instrument did receive an NSF MRI award and is proceeding past its PDR and optics FDR for people who love uh, after and VR, you know, the preliminary and final design reviews. Uh, major procurements for that instrument are underway. We're uh, continuing to work forward on, on the DMOS detector upgrade, which is the replacement of the detector package and the hexapod unit uh, of, of DMOS to get that going. We've done the long lead procurement beginning on that, and the high spec instrument PDR work is underway. So, this is just a ton of stuff happening right now. So, I got to give a shout out to Mark Catholic and the whole crew for trying to organize this chaos and uh, managing to pull it off exceedingly well. Um, and, and update on just where we're at in terms of some of the federal funding prospects prospects for the instruments we want to build. Um, the SCALES instrument was selected for the MRI award. Um, we, there was three other uh, submissions to the NSF on multiple scales of DEMOS and high-spec instruments for, for MRIs and for um, LIGER, the MSRI2 proposal was not selected. Um, but you know, this, this funding environment, this is is really just a, a, a well. I will characterize it kindly. You know, it's an un, it's an unfortunate funding environment right now. I think there is one glimmer potentially of hope, which is this last point, which is that um, in FY twenty four, that is the first time that the NSF can respond to the detail. All of their fiscal planning has been prior to the detail survey, and the way that the Office of Management and Budget from the White House works with the agency to define what their budget requests are year over year. So hopefully in FY24, we can see some things. This is one of some of the stuff that Liz and I are intending to talk about in our discussions in about 2020. For those of you thinking of proposing an MSIP, the MSIP round is unlikely until this happens. Um, so you know, that, that's unlikely to happen for a bit of time. Um, some strategic considerations, I think, before I hand it back to Hilton, um, you know, the thing that I'll take away from it, and, and, and Bruce can tell me if I'm wrong, because he helped write it, you know, as for 2020 ski summit, so we're actually affecting these rates. Every single one of these rates is the observatory. And so our future is exceedingly bright in realizing the science that this document is mapped out. Um, the current federal funding scenario, on the other hand, you know, is currently unable to keep pace 
with this ambitious document. And so it is beholden upon us, the community, not us, John Bruce Hilton, but the entire community to change that fact. And that can only be done by you know, coordinating campaigns and outreach at state, federal, international levels to actually try to improve this scenario. And Bruce and I will talk about that a bit, but this is one of my uh, great side passions in life. So if you want to talk to me about federal funding engagement, please do. And with that, I will hand it back to you. Okay. I'll just comment on uh, John mentioned pointing KP at the moon. As to my recollection, we've never actually had the moon on a detector attack. We did have it on a big piece of paper. Oh, well, we'll have to have a discussion about that. <laughs> I thought it was legal. It is illegal. <laughs> never surprise the boss or allow the boss to be surprised. <laughs> So, so I just wanted to introduce the, the strategic plan. Bruce, just because you're director doesn't mean you can keep monopolizing the conversation. Um, okay, so I want to do the only remaining criteria is the size. Okay. I, I regret to inform you we did actually point the telescope at the side, but before there were uh, many segments. Okay. Um, the strategic plan. So there's a session tomorrow that John will lead discussing the uh, science strategic plan. Um, but I wanted to just introduce the overall uh, or give you a status update of where we are in the strategic plan. Uh, and in fact, we're going to the board in uh, another two months to discuss most of the elements of it and hopefully get final approval in mind. So, oh, why am I not seeing it advance over here? Okay. Okay, so there's basically three three uh, ideas behind it. One is to to maintain and extend science, science leadership of the observatory. Second one is around resilience, and uh, the third one is around the partnership. And the and the science leadership component is really through instrumentation and and data. Those are the two sort of key pillars. But we also see efficiency and quality of the data as a as a way to extend our leadership. And the whole point of the strategic plan is to uh, find the future in the era of the ELTs. So um, that's that's one of the sort of key elements of the of the strategic plan. In terms of resilience, it's really about ensuring the observatory is at peak performance for the next several decades. Uh, clearly, staff and the, the uh, our ability to staff uh, the observatory is, is with the right kind of people is really important. Um, I think leadership is going to be important because there, it's a very challenging period over the next decade. And uh, so we need the right people uh, across our community, not just in, in Hawaii and in Hawaii Um And you can read some of the other elements we have. I do think that you know, our risk posture is, is important to maximize the limited resources we have. We can't play it safe and we can't be, we can't be cowboys either. And so how to navigate that in the context of the of the current environment is, is quite critical. And then last thing I want to talk about partnership, because very, very often we think of partners as you know Caltech and UC, possibly NASA, but there's much more to it than that. And so I've identified what they are. And the astronomy community is a huge part of it. I mean, it's you in the room and it's broader because we need to extend our reach uh, uh, beyond just that. And as John said, that's key for our funding prospects too. To be able to to change the narrative in, in DC. Uh, there's Monica observatories themselves, which increasingly are interdependent. There's a Hawaiian community, and more about that in just a second. Uh, and uh, we have uh, our philanthropic partners play key roles. KPF and KCRM are, are essentially enabled by philanthropy, although there's a significant federal component to both. And then, of course, our traditional part partners, Caltech, UC, and, and NASA, and the smaller partners that, that play a role as well. So this is all the underpinning of the strategic plan. More about that tomorrow. All right. Sorry, I have to. This is so like weird. It's just a delay. Oh, a very long delay. OK, so around uh, Mauna Kea, um, uh, there's a new government structure in place called the MKSOA, Mauna Kea Stewardship and, and Oversight Authority. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of concern, misinformation, all that floating around it. So let me tell you my perspective. I think it's a very positive thing for astronomy in Hawaii and the continuation of astronomy. That 
includes the existing telescope and, and, the, and the prospects of the TMT. Um, I think it's an essential prerequisite for our ability to renew the lease in 2033, which sounds like a long way away, but when you look at all the various uh, pieces that have to be in place, is 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 immediate. Um, so without this, I don't believe, I, I, we may have found a way, but it would have been extremely painful. And this gives us an opportunity to completely change the narrative. And I believe the narrative is already changing and has changed. Uh, so the perspective from leadership at Keck, our board, and, and those of us in the leadership role, is this is a good thing. Uh, it doesn't mean there's not a lot of work. It doesn't mean there's a lot of uncertainty. All of that is true. Our very own Rich Matsuda, who's been with the observatory for a very long time, is the astronomy representative on this on this board. Um, and I think that's he's a, an outstanding person for that role. Um, in terms of community engagement, we're spending a lot of effort and actually a lot of money on this now. And it's the key to the long-term future because there's really two things that have to happen. We have to improve the relationship with our community and we have to get a new lease. And they're not separable. And so we're spending a lot of effort to make sure that actually can happen. And, it, and our approach is, is completely consistent with uh, what is in the state of the profession part of the decadal report. Um, and, and I would add one more thing. It's not just a hope. We are actually are seeing changes in the environment and have for, for uh, the, at least the past year. So a lot of work has gone into it, but I think there's a benefit. There's an upcoming talk just a little later this morning by Rich, and uh, it'll be an opportunity for you to hear from the horse's mouth what's happening. Okay, now uh, another element that's starting to show up at Tech is the Climate Action Plan. And I thought I'd like to share with you what our actual commitment is. And uh, so the rationale is the obvious ones there. Of course, there's an urgent uh, worldwide um, necessity, but uh, we're also driven by the expectations of the staff at the observatory, and particularly the younger members of our staff. It's If you want to hire people and you want to retain them, you have to pay attention to this, even if you have no other interest in the topic. But we do have a very strong interest in, in this. I think we have the possibility of being a role model amongst the other observatories on the at the summit of Monica. And I think it's very important for our local community, for the state of Hawaii, because the state has very, very ambitious uh, uh, climate um, goals or some carbon goals, and that means everyone has to play their part. It's not just you pass a law and it's all that. Um, now, in terms of our commitment, we uh, are are committing to be carbon neutral by 2030. But I think there are actually significant opportunities to do that earlier. It's a matter of resources at this point. Um, but I think we we can we've laid out a, a broad uh, uh, roadmap for this, but we turning it into an actual plan. And we have some specific goals for the, the next year. We have two papers. One is an SBIE paper that's just been published, but it's behind a paywall. I can give you copies of that if you're interested. And there's a Nature um, Astronomy article coming out imminently. Um, okay, so there's some low-hanging fruit. I think if you uh, follow the climate um, um, Thinking there are three three areas scope one two and three one is the direct emissions one the energy you purchase and the third is every all the activities you do that lead to CO two emissions. Um, for us, the simple thing to do. Most, I'll show you the statistic the numbers in just a minute. But we are electrifying our fleet in the coming uh, years, and we have started. Um, in terms of scope two, which is electricity usage. There are a lot of ideas floating around that cake to significantly reduce it. Um, I mentioned some of them here. For example, the ventilation fans in the last half hour of the night, the, most people think that will have no effect on, on the domes, but it would have a significant effect on, on our energy usage. Um, so we're proposing experiments to, to do these, to check these kind of things. We can use outside uh, cool air instead of uh, air conditioning. And as we're modernizing equipment and replacing old equipment, we of course look for energy efficiency as a, as a prime factor. And then scope three is everything else, everything you do. And for us, it's mostly about travel from Hawaii to the mainland for our staff and for you to Hawaii to observe. And um, there are ways we're looking at ways we can reduce both. Pajama motors is one example that can be extended to something. Um, okay, so. 
In terms of, I want to show you a table to show you that it's not just talk. This is actual, it's actually in the papers that have been produced. And to give you a sense, you can see that the vast majority of our carbon emissions is go to, and it's, um, it's sitting there nearly 80%. But yeah, there's some other uh, important pieces. The bottom line number, I think, is 2,000 tons of CO2 emitted per year to run your favorite observatory. And so if you divide it by the number of people in the room, that means each of you are responsible for about 20 tons. No, it's not that bad. But uh, uh, it's, an, it's eye opening, actually. Okay, so that's that's where we're at on, on carbon. And I take it very seriously. I think this is an important long term commitment for the observatory. Okay, now the last slide I have is just about community, uh, with, by which I mean the observing community, our observing community. Um, I think a, uh, a, a key part of our success has been the interaction of the community with the staff at the, at the observatory. As you know, it's been very close for a very long time. And uh, this, this synergy between what the uh, astronomers need and what the staff can provide and the ideas that flow between the two of them have been absolutely central. And that has been mostly in person. Um, of course, that's threatened by the new ways we all work now. And so we really have to take very seriously how we can maintain what's made us made possible so much in the past. Um, we do have various things that promote the connection. I really want to, to remind everyone about the Cape Visiting Scholars Program, which we restarted in this uh, past year again. Uh, I think that's really important for young researchers to get exposure to the, both the facility, the people, the ideas, because those are the uh, the future leaders in our field. And, and that that connection, I believe, cannot be replaced by uh, email and Zoom. Um, we want to bring up, and we are bringing our staff astronomers more to you, so that when they do their research work, they can be based at the university partners or elsewhere uh, to to promote that. And we're starting to put uh, place our staff away from Hawaii. Um, there are a small number that are working here on the mainland, and I think that will increase, but particularly we'll look for people working, tech staff working at Caltech Music campuses. Um, and I think uh, the other part is it's really important for all of you to, to participate in the governance. Um, the governance structures that are often populated by people who serve and then continue to serve year after year. And although we love that, uh, we do need to broaden broaden the reach to a, a much bigger cross section of our of our community. So I remind you, this is your observatory, um, and it's operated for you and for your science. And uh, so you have to make this work too. Uh, so with that, I'd like to close and happy to take questions. And the hard question should go to John. <laughs> I do have some questions from Q&A. Okay, here. Uh, one here. Oh, have you thought about bringing the science team out to do science retreats? Or are we done writing retreats? Which have been really yeah, impressive. we have. I mean, the writing retreats, I think, were very successful. It was great because they were of an extended period, ones at Utah in particular. I would love to do that. We certainly support it. Um, we haven't act actively re you know, restarted that, but I think that's an important idea. Or to extend the model. Yeah, the other thing we've encouraged uh, is people spending sabbatical time, sabbaticals in tech. You, you know, anything from a month to, to a year and so on. So if you're interested in that, you should speak to John and myself. Okay. Uh, for the climate plan, what fraction of the carbon we have in the process? We've talked about uh, the questions of what fraction of our uh, of the climate plan will be achieved through carbon offsets. So, in fact, we we could offset all of our scope one our direct emissions today at modest cost, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, and we we're talking about it. Uh, so, uh, and it, it conceivably will show up in our budget this coming year. There's a turns out the the other big pressure on our budget apart from instrumentation, is everything around monetary and monetary engagement. And one way we're looking at um, integrating those two is to do climate offsets in Hawaii, which would provide work, local work and uh, help the local community. But we're not planning to do it on scope two or three at this stage. At this stage. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so I actually have someone with a hand up. It's Bruce Berman. I'm going to, Bruce, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. There we go. One more time, Bruce. This would have called a dark question. I know, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I think my hand was raised by accident. I apologize. <laughs> was there another? Nope, that was just that one. Other discussion? We have plenty of time here. Adam, again. Uh, on the internship program, uh, the Disney College program, is there a thought to turn that from an unpaid internship to a paid internship? Because unpaid is actually a very important it's completely funded by philanthropy, and we actually fundraise a few years in advance. So based on the current amount we have, the answer is no. I mean, it covers all other costs, travel, and, um, and uh, but there's no actual stipend associated with it. John, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. That was the exact answer. Yeah. So, I mean, we could, we could consider it that. The, the philanthropic um, environment is very, um, it's uncertain, you know, you never quite know what you're going to get. So that's why we fundraise several years in advance for programs like this. I'm going to take a moment to follow on, on John advertising what we're going to try to talk about tomorrow at lunch on the, the astro landscape. Um, Partially, if, if you looked at those slides and wondered what the hell an MSIP is and why it's different than an MSRI and MRI and all these acronyms we talked around, we'll try to explain the process through which NSF funds tech instruments and other large scale projects. But more than that, NSF funding for astronomy is approaching existential crisis levels. The amount of free energy in NSF to fund astronomy other than their existing and future NSF owned facilities like Euro Rubin is actually shrinking year by year significantly in spite of all the things that are, that are going on in modern astronomy to the point where if it continues on those trajectories, we won't be able to build new tech instruments with NSF on it. We won't be able to get astronomy and astrophysics grants to release the tech associated data. And so we want to talk about why that's true, but more positively, what we can do to try and reverse that, the complicated process through which NSF astronomy's budget is set and prioritized and how all of us, from students to, to senior faculty in the leadership roles, can try to engage in DC and locally to try and do something about that situation. Because honestly, astronomers have not been paying enough collective attention to for the most part. We, we lobby for our favorite NASA projects. We don't really figure out how to engage with NSF. And I don't know how to do that yet, which is why I'm here to have this conversation with people like John, who know the system more. And over the next year, figure out ways to get all of you um, engaged in this. Okay, that, that's a conversation for that's an advertisement for a conversation. This is an advertisement, yeah. This is not to have a conversation now. This is in case it looks really boring in the session tomorrow. I promise it won't be. <laughs> and it really is important. So, do we have other questions for the director of technology? So you were talking about the observing efficiency and how it looks great, but there were problems with getting come back to AO, but I don't think it's a high burden. So, I'm curious. Return to um, where you see that you mean the specific issue that we've been having over the past several months on AO? Yeah, we had the whole year first. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say our biggest area of technical challenge has been the existing operational AO system. Can you and, repeat the question? Sorry. Oh, the question is in terms of our um, overall efficiency and the technical downtime, uh, how do I see AO? And right So uh, the challenge that we have is we we have to do all of our installation new systems on an existing operational system that's in very heavy use, um, and that is fraught because if you make a mistake or I mean, think it's not a mistake, if things happen as you're installing it, then um, you've got to try and recover with very little time. And we've had some particularly particular ch challenges with the KEC2 pyramid wavefront sensor and the KEC1 uh, laser system. Uh, so John and I and Peter Wazenowicz and uh, Randy Camel, Jim Lyke have been talking about this. Uh, our 
uh, what we would like to do is change our scheduling so there's much greater lots of time between when we do major surgery on the, on the optical benches and when the, when it's required for operations to try and get the, the uh, operational load under control. But it's hard to do. We've only been we've been talking about it for several months, and we we are trying to build some of that into the upcoming schedule. But we probably have to do something more significant, like making AO unavailable for several months at the appropriate time of year, so we can we can handle this properly. Right now, we're very challenged just by the number of uh, people that we have, you know, and we've got pretty much everyone who can contribute working on these problems. But it's, uh, you know, I want to just be clear, we know there's a big problem and we're trying to figure out how to, how to handle it. Next. You want to say anything about, uh, and Aaron is our next speaker, so maybe it'll come up then, but uh, about the evolution of the instrument suite, given all of the aspirations that are, there are for new instruments, we saw some of the acronym yeah. of proposals. Uh, how do you see well, the existing instruments evolving? Yeah. The right, so I think there are really two elements. One is to, to keep in mind how our, how our instrumentation has to evolve as the, as the ecosystem has evolved. And um, so we can't just continue with the existing instrumentation by small tweaks. And the other one has been, how do we cope with a, a, a time where our instruments are costing us uh, 20 to $25 million per instrument for a major uh, instrument at this point. Uh, and so that that's um, trying to square that with, with the funding that Bruce was talking about, funding uh, issues um, has really, um, shaped our thinking on it. The way I see it evolving is we, we focus much more on uh, rather than single instruments, the, the suite of capabilities. So for example, in exoplanets, uh, the KPF high spec and scale is the, as the exoplanet suite of instrumentation. We see something similar with imaging spectroscopy with uh, you know the discussion that it had around or the evolution around the wide field imager and Phobos. Uh, so, uh, I think that's that's the way we're trying to see our instrumentation rather than a specific instrumentation opportunities. And John, I don't think you have anything you'd like to add. I think the only other thing that I might add is uh, we also have limited real estate and limited capabilities to maintain and operate a, a, an ever-growing suite of instruments. So at the same time, we have to look at which instruments we're going to start to turn off, right? You know, as KPF comes online, do we evaluate when? And if to turn off high res as KCRM comes online, do we evaluate when and if to turn off things like ESI and things like that? So we have to start to look at instrument decommissioning as we bring these new capabilities. Some are easy to look at and just say this is a rope replacement. Others are more difficult. But I think we have to be responsible in how we uh, manage the resources that we have at the observatory to provide science every night and to give new capabilities and to maintain existing capabilities. And that, that ecosystem is an interesting one to try to balance. And it's a big part of our thinking for the for the next 15 years. Yeah. So, uh, given the difficulty in getting funding from NSF, is there a plan to use that philanthropy to get funding to invite those to the telescope to after the two or the telescope so the question is, what are I think what are uh, plans to increase philanthropy uh, to help fund instrumentation at the observatory? So first, let me tell you, there's a, a an interesting challenge about um, getting money for using for, for for access to the telescope by philanthropists, and the challenge is. The land that we've built on is ceded land. It well, originally belonged to the Kingdom of Hawaii, and we are prohibited from making a profit for operating on that land. So we can't sell stuff. We can't sell access. You know, we can't charge a rich person twenty thousand dollars for a visit. Um, and so that that kind of activity is actually prohibited. Um, we're also non-profit. We have to be very careful about making profit on things for our, our tax status. Uh, but the reality is we, we need some which are vastly more than that. You know, it's, it's great when someone gives us $100,000 and we use it very efficiently, but we're talking about tens of millions of dollars in order to be successful. So our, our whole approach to philanthropy is quite different from that. Um, it's around 
cultivating people with significant um, uh, capability and uh, who have an interest in, in astronomy or, or science uh, and the promotion of science. Thank uh -huh. 